So one thing we wanted to take time to do today was just sort of briefly go through the sessions that we've already had together. So kind of a brief content overview. So you'll recall way back when um, in session one, we had um, or we discussed MTSS as sort of a broad overview. Um, so you'll remember this was when we talked about MTSS frameworks assisting and working for the all students, um, as well as all educators, right, and administrators that are working with those students day in and day out. Um, and this was also the session where we briefly went over some main data around special education data and had some brief conversation around, you know, how, if at all, could an, a, a, a high quality NTSS framework benefit those students who um, are, are identified in special education services. After that, we went into session two, which was resource mapping. So this was a session where you recall we discussed, um, we were having a dinner party, right? And you had to sort of prepare something for your guests with what you had available to you then and there, right? There was no grocery shopping, there was no appliance shopping. You had to uh, work with what you had available in that moment. And resource mapping sort of covered a variety of other components like facilities, people, data, um, etc. So we'll talk some more about that as we move through today as well. In session three, we went over the hexagon tool. So after we sort of gathered our resources from session two, um, then we showed you uh, an example of a tool that sort of dis um, disaggregates some information from a resource. So we focused primarily on curriculum or instructional programs in this session, and we talked about you know the need, the supports, the evidence, the capacity, the fit, etc., um, and how that particular curriculum or program that you're using fits um, the need of your school population. In session four, we went through the capacity assessment. So this was sort of all hands on deck. Um, so once you've decided what resources are available to you, uh, maybe filtered it through the hexagon tool to determine further what's truly useful and available, and then deciding, okay, do we even have the capacity to implement this and do it well? And then our most recent session was family engagement and the importance of that in any setting, but then also how an MTSS framework could sort of help us assess our family engagement strategies and improve on those. Go for it. Um, okay, so before um, Nicole and I get into some modeling of action planning and looking at each of the different segments of, of action planning using the resource mapping as a framework, which is basically what we're going to do. We're gonna take those, um, the six elements of the resource mapping that we talked about previously and we're going to break down some of the actions that you can take around those things to kind of put them in forward motion. Um, but there's a couple of things that generally happen before we do action planning. And then there's also a process for action planning that tends to get um, some pretty good results, right? Because it, it really delineates like who, the what, the why, and when, right? That those things are going to happen. Um, so the first thing that you're going to do anytime that you are getting ready to um, do action planning to solve a problem, right, to, to, or to solve a challenge that you have going on, um, I highly encourage that you take the time to, to assess the challenge, right? And so to assess the challenge, really what you're asking is, you know, what is it that I am trying to accomplish? What is the goal that I'm trying to reach? What is the problem that I am trying to solve? Where am I now and where do I want to be? And then you would answer that, right? You would put an answer and you'd be like, okay, well, this is where I am now and this is where I wanna go. But once you figure out where it is that you're going, there's, there's always going to be things that are going to get in your way. And so to assess that challenge, what I encourage folks to do is to really sort of like stop and think and pre-populate some of the potential barriers that you could imagine getting in your way. And to do that, or, or the reason for doing that is so that you can kind of already pre-plan for them, right? So, you know, if you have a barrier and you're like, oh, this is going to be a barrier, you could always start to say, well, if and when that happens or when or if that happens, this is how I might be able to respond. Um, it takes away a little bit of the responding on the fly um, by having it sort of like already planned out. Once you've done that, 
and you've gone through and done your assess the challenge and you've assessed sort of the situation you're in and the barriers that may exist, you use that information and you write a goal, right? So this is where I am. This is where I want to be. This is what I think might get in my way, but ultimately my goal is this. And then you would write down your goal. The goal then gets written on the assess the challenge um, template, but then it also gets rewritten into the top of your action plan. Because at this point, every single action that you take is designed to get you to that goal, right? So you want your goal to be you know, really specific. Um, and then within that action plan, you would break it down. Well, I'm going to do this. This is why I'm going to make a target. So what part of the goal is it targeting? How long am I giving myself or how long does my team have to do that? And who is going to be responsible? And then actually writing that name in there. It's also helpful sometimes if you put two people under responsibility, um, because one person will be responsible and then the other person could be accountability, right? And kind of doing it that way. And then the other thing that action planning includes, uh, and you won't want to forget, is thinking about how some of the decisions that you're making are going to impact some of the, um, some of the other um, areas of your population. So economically disadvantaged. So asking yourself, you know, is my goal going to disadvantage uh, my low SES students? Is my is my target or goal going to disadvantage or marginalize my English language learners, et cetera, et cetera? So keeping a lens on on equity at the focus. Um, I am going to go ahead and drop some links in the chat to each of these so that you can have them um, while we go through and and work through some stuff today. Um, but these would be the two um, tools that I would suggest using as part of the action planning process. Great, thank you, Andrea. Okay. So this, let me put in present mode here. So this next sort of template, if you will, um, I'll share with you in the chat box when I'm done explaining it, but this is going to be something to help continue to help guide your planning moving forward. So taking into consideration everything we've talked about, like I said, in the last five sessions um, and the two templates that Andrea just shared, which will be available for you as well in your action planning conversations. Um, this is just another sort of guide to help you make sure you sort of check off all the boxes, I guess. So there's a quick session recap. Is the titles of each. And then as you start to plan your next steps and you move forward with a strong MTSS framework, it's going to take commitment, right, from a number of engaged educators. So as you sort of take the time, if you haven't already in your individual settings, to think about who should be sitting on this team of MTSS, who should be part of the ongoing conversation, then you might wanna take a moment to sort of think about, okay, who would be the facilitator of that team? So that might be an administrator, it might be a teacher, it might be a parent, um, it could be anybody. But it, the facilitator is gonna be the person who organizes the meetings and keeps the group moving forward toward a common goal, right? So really helps the team stay on track and not lose sight of why you come together for the conversations that you have. And then Andrea and I would recommend to sort of taking those resource mapping components, which I'll share um, slide by slide in just a moment, and sort of identifying who, maybe one person, maybe a few people, can carry out each of those component pieces of the resource mapping protocol. Um, so this would be something that's determined perhaps in the first meeting, in the, in the first gathering of your MTSS team. And then once you've identified those roles and, and folks know what is going to come next, um, then you can move forward with setting some um, ongoing meeting times um, to continue the conversation. So you recall last, or two sessions ago, in session four capacity assessment, Andrea shared with us at one district's timeline, um, and that was really helpful for that team to sort of map out their year and determine when they were going to do what and who was going to do what. So that might be something that your, is part of your action planning moving forward is developing a timeline. Um, certainly doesn't have to be, but it has proven to be helpful um, for other districts. 
So the first resource mapping component was people. So there's a, a slide here that um, obviously identifies that. And then there's a space to, to identify somebody on your team who will look more closely at this part of the puzzle, right? So you're gonna have that person identify, determine, and organize. So you want them to identify those that you have access to and what resources they might offer the team. So they might identify a principal, a guidance counselor, an ed tech, a parent. Could, options are pretty endless there. Once you've identified those um, as people as resources, you need to determine how you'll learn about their resources, right? So what can the principal bring to an MTSS team? What can a guidance counselor, what can a secretary bring to your team? So you have to determine a way to gather that information. Um, it might be through a survey, it might be through staff highlights or maybe some kind of a morale event. Um, you might recall during this session, we talked about how at the Department of Ed, you know, we have hundreds of staff that work for the Department of Education, and it's impossible to know each and every one and who does what and what their hobbies are and what they like to do outside of work. So one um, technique that we use in our department is staff highlights. So every week, our communications department highlights one staff member and shares it socially, not just with those of us that work, you know, collegiately, but out on our social media pages. And it highlights that person, their role, how they got into their role, like what, what led them there. And then it also highlights what they like to do outside for fun and, and their day-to-day -day life. And that's just sort of a great way for us to know who our colleagues are. Um, and if you think of that on a smaller scale in this piece for an MTSS team, um, you can really start to identify those resources in your setting and who has what to offer. Um, once you've gathered that information, you can organize it in an accessible way. So maybe on a spreadsheet, maybe in a booklet, maybe a highlight wall in the teacher room, something that all educators, whether they're part of the MTSS team or not, that all educators have access to and can see. Oh, I didn't know that Mr. Mike, the custodian, really enjoys soccer. Like, you know, to Andrea's example a few sessions ago, you know, I have a student who's struggling coming to school, but I also know that that student likes soccer. Maybe Mr. Mike can talk to that student or can encourage that student through soccer um, and sort of in, and make it exciting to come to school because that student knows he's gonna be able to talk and hang out and talk about soccer with Mr. Mike, right? Uh, organizing that so that everybody has access to um, everybody's resources there. Okay, and so each of the slides that we're gonna go through um, and, and, and model through the next couple of um, minutes is also going to have a part two where um, here are some of the big takeaways that are not necessarily action planning, but like the big ideas that come behind each of the elements as we think about them as a resource. Um, and so as Nicole said, you know, one of the things that you're going to want to really do is to think about your people as a resource, right? And a good place to start is to start like categorizing them. So like, well, we've got principal, we've got assistant principal, we've got counselors, we've got social worker, we've got, you know, six third grade teachers, six fourth grade teachers, you know, however that goes. Uh, and then, and really kind of put them in there, like kind of map them out by their role. But what is equally as important is that process of figuring out what all of the people in your building have to offer the collective uh, good of your program or your school, right? So just because a principal is a principal doesn't necessarily mean that that principal uh, loves and is good at scheduling, for example, right? So if you're looking at running an MTSS, a full-scale MTSS, and you are uh, saying, geez, you know, I really am going to need to modify my schedule, my master schedule for my program or my school, um, and that person's really not so great at that, um, yeah, will they do it as part of their job? Sure, but wouldn't it be great if you knew that that you know, Mr. Bob, the secretary, loves a good scheduling puzzle and would love to sit down with you and help you with that puzzle? Just because Mr. Bob is a secretary does not mean that he can't participate in the master schedule planning if that's something that he has expertise and passion and is good at, right? So it would be really important to know, like, what are some of the hidden skills that the other adults have in your building? Instead of looking outside to figure out what you can bring in, 
look inside first, right? Um, and then the other place to think about, um, which I would also consider to be um, somewhat of an inside and an outside is that family and communer, community partnerships, right? So just like that principal doesn't have to be the hero if there are people in his charge that can do the job better and more efficiently than him or her, you are also going to have family members that are going to want to contribute in any way that they can to your program or to your school, right? And so, you know, if you knew that that Nicholas's dad is really good at, you know, scheduling, right? We'll use that just as an example again, and you have to overhaul your master schedule. Why couldn't Nicholas's dad come in and help, you know, tell him what it is that you're looking for and let him help to figure it out? And there's nothing confidential about that. There's nothing, there doesn't need to be any student names, no confidentiality issues, but you've maximized the resources that you have available to you. So that would be the big takeaway is like, make sure we don't categorize or pigeonhole people based on their title. Let's somehow figure out how to way to elevate um, additional skills that they may have that their title may not suggest that they have. Great. So the other component of resource mapping was time. Um, so here again, there's a space to identify a lead. It might be the same person as before, it could be somebody else. And that person will determine and identify twice. So they're gonna determine what time that you have available to meet and carry out your goals. So looking forward at schedules, um, do you, are you gonna meet weekly and then maybe move to monthly? Um, are you gonna meet before, after school? And right, and so this could be the MTSS team facilitator as well that sort of organizes this work, um, but gathering information around, not just when you can meet as a team, um, but when, when might be a good time available to talk about layering supports to work with a teacher um, who's having difficulty with a group of students or a group of students who are having difficulty with an academic content and whatnot. This person's also going to identify student time. So for example, how much time are students spending in class? Um, do they get pulled out for any additional services, right? How much time are they spending with their lead teacher versus an allied arts teacher, um, a Title I teacher, a special education teacher, etc.? And how much time are they spending, oops, my apologies. How much time are they spending um, at recess, lunch, in those allied arts classrooms, etc.? And then don't forget to look at the teacher time. What does he or she have available as time in class for prep time, for break time, etc.? When can you best utilize their services and their time um, to incorporate a layered support, a conversation, um, a new resource, whatever it might be? And then how will this information be collected and assessed? So similar to last, the other component of people, how are you gonna collect student time, collect teacher time? And then where is it going to be um, stored so that everybody has access to it? Part two. So my second favorite resource to think about and to reorganize um, is time. And so if you think about it, time is one of your biggest resources and it's complementary. We all have time, but we don't believe that we have time. There's no time. I have no time to do this, no time to do that, no time to do anything, no, no time, no time, no time. When it comes to time, it's, it's important when you're trying to implement a full-scale MTSS to change your perspective about how you utilize time as a resource. And when you think about time as a resource rather than a constraint, meaning a resource is something that works for you, whereas a constraint is generally something that works against you. So you want to reframe your thinking about how you can use that time as a resource. Uh, you've heard the phrase probably, you know, that time is money, right? Well, it's generally true also when we're trying to use it in another way. If you have a dollar and you need to stretch that dollar as far as it can possibly go, the last place that you're gonna go to spend it is a place where you can't break that dollar down into, into individual components, right? So, you know, if you, if you go to the store to buy a candy bar with your dollar, but you have a couple of people with you that you might want to share your chocolate with, it might be better for you to get a different kind of chocolate or like a different kind of candy, right? Because you're going to want to maximize what that dollar can provide you. If you think of a minute 
or a chunk of, or a five minute block or a 15 minute block, or even an hour long block as a dollar. And you have to think about how far, what, is, what do I have to do to the time within that block to stretch it as far as I can possibly make it so that it's working for me as a resource you're gonna to wanna to think about how you might be able to manipulate the time that you have available to you. Um, and so, you know, how will you know if like you're, if you're stretching your time as far as you can possibly stretch it? Well, you know, you can do a quick pulse check. Are the students succeeding? Are behaviors down among the students? Are behaviors down among your teachers? Are behaviors up, positive behaviors up among your teachers? Um, are adults still complaining that they're stressed or uh, and they don't have enough time? And, uh, you know, so there are things that you can listen for that can give you really valuable feedback. And then I know that it's easy for me to say this and it's easy for Nicole to say this because we're not actually the ones that are doing it, but I implore you never be afraid to say this isn't working and fix it. Because if you were the one that wrote it in, you can, be, you can also advocate for the change that may need to come, right? So that's why on your MTSS team, which we don't get into a lot today, but on your team, you must have some kind of decision maker, somebody that can work through a decision process with you. Um, and you also want that person to be bought into the MTSS process, because if they're not bought into the process, then they're not gonna wanna support the changes that you suggest. Um, but time is a resource, remember that. Okay, the other big component, you will recall from the second session when we talked about this, um, is curriculum and instructional programs. So when we met originally and discussed this, this was one of the pieces where we made a long running list of all the various curricula and instructional programs available to schools. Um, and it's very possible, uh, I would probably bet my life on it, that your setting doesn't use everything on that list. Um, so it's going to be important for you to sort of pull together exactly what is available to your teachers and to your staff. And then I would encourage you to also do that by grade level. Um, so just because we use handwriting without tears in our pre-K and K classrooms, it doesn't mean that those materials um, are available for teachers in um, you know, second, third, fourth grade, etc. Um, so make sure you sort of organize it by grade. Uh, what is the title of the curriculum and the program that you have available and what are the materials available to teachers? And then once you've done that, you can identify and go through the, the fidelity requirements to implement each of those curricula and instructional programs. So, you know, what level of training is involved um, with new teachers taking on a new curriculum? What kind of ongoing training is available? What, what kind of coaching is available? Do they have the specific assessments um, that you should utilize to, to make sure you're getting the right information about whatever you're implementing in your classrooms? And then I would encourage you to take a few, and maybe take all of them, um, but I know schools often have a lot, so maybe take one or two per grade and run it through that hexagon tool. See if, if, if it really shapes up to be the program that you need and the program that you thought it was, right? Um, and, and you might be pleasantly surprised and you might say, oh, you wanna know what? We have this, we haven't used it in a long time and come to find out it's not something that we need to have on our list anymore and make available to teachers, let's move on or vice versa. Uh, we have this, we haven't used it in a really long time. It's been sitting on a shelf, but come to find out we have some teachers on staff that um, are really qualified in implementing this and maybe we should give it another shot. Um, so making sure you have a nice comprehensive list of everything that's available and uh, making that information available to teachers as well. Okay, don't forget, we have um, this set of books in the reading library that you have access to. Don't forget, we have materials for this curriculum um, to replenish or replace ones that have been loved in your classrooms or, or whatnot. Okay, so like the other slides, we also have a curriculum and instruction part two. This is um, taking the, uh, or overlaying, you know, the big, the big ideas, the big takeaways um, to help support the action planning that Nicole just went through. Um, and so I want you to remember, if nothing else, about curriculum and instruction planning, um, that you are in control, not the curriculum. 
sometimes we allow the uh, curriculum to dictate how we set up our schedules, how we group students, how we provide support to students, how we um, do all of these things. Um, but ultimately, the, it's the people that are in control, right? And so, um, if there is, and so, um, so there is that. But then the other part of that, the other big idea behind that, um, is like that process that we did several weeks ago, where we created that list, and then we looked at that list and we asked ourselves, like, which which tier would this go into? Which tier would this go into? Which tier would this go into? Um, remember, because you are the one that's in control, you can also change how and where a curriculum fits within your system of support. So if you've got a group of students in your tier one, and it's pretty clear that a large majority of them are not being successful in a certain, you know, in a certain topic or in a certain skill, I mean, you could just uh, add more time or more practice or more homework or more, um, you know, or more of those kinds of things. Or you could alter that tier one setting and think of it as more of a tier two setting and take one of your tier two interventions and apply it at the tier one level, at the whole group level. There's nothing saying that you can't do that. <laughs> and so when you put a curriculum or a program or an instructional practice into one of the categories of tier one, tier two, tier three, special ed, you know, whatever, um, you can also take it out of that category to use it at whatever point you need it to be used. It, it doesn't have to be siloed and stay in that silo. It's good to sort them so that you have an idea of where you're starting from and where you can go when you need additional supports for students. Um, but never assume that just because a program sits in tier two or just because a program sits in tier three that you can't use it at one of the other tiers because that's that's simply, that's a misnomer. And um, But again, that comes down to uh, you know, the decision maker on the MTSS team, you know, you're going to want that person to be bought in and um, interested in making sure that the MTSS is running as smoothly as possible. Moving on to data, um, similarly to what we did for curriculum and instructional programs, we did the same for data. So we've made a, a sort of whole group list of the student data that you all currently collect. Um, and we identified the tool that you use to collect that. So doing that in on a much smaller scale as far as within your own settings um, will be much more beneficial for everybody moving forward in your action plan. So you might um, find that you use dial in pre-K and K, but you use other screening tools in grades one and up, for example. Um, some schools utilize teacher-created assessments in pre-K through grade three, et cetera. So making a nice comprehensive list of what you use to collect data um, by grade level and by tool will help you to determine um, it, what's available for folks moving forward. So just because they use dial in one grade and not in another, is there something um, that's similar that, they, that folks could utilize that give a similar data set, for example. Once you have that list, then you can determine where to save and access this data. Uh, for example, in a locked spreadsheet, especially um, like Andrea said earlier around confidentiality, if there's student names or any personally um, identifiable, identifiable information, then you want to make sure that um, you have a secure platform to save that data. Um, if you're just looking at numbers in general and not disaggregating it down to the student name or student level, then that's different. Um, and certainly you'll want to make sure that moving forward in your MTSS meetings that you're scheduling regular time to review the data and make those data-driven decisions. So just because dial is done once in the beginning of the school year doesn't mean that information um, and data isn't collected for student growth and student development over time that should be revisited, right? So you'll wanna make sure you're scheduling that maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, whatever um, level works for you all. And again, you could utilize the Hexagon tool to identify um, the data source and, and see sort of how it fits. You know, is this collecting the information that we need to make decisions based on our programs? Uh, it, it, is it giving us everything that we thought it would? And that Hexagon tool, that uh, graphic organizer is there to assist in those conversations as well. Okay, so the big ideas um, when you're thinking about data, 
um, is now that you've got a process that you can use for collection and um, you know and thinking about how you're going to collect the data, how you're going to store the data, the you know the time frame from which or the calendar blocks of when you're going to screen and things like that. One big thing to keep in mind about data is that um, we always tend to have too much of it and we don't use it. Uh, or we have so much of it that it, there's too much to tell us what it is that we want it to tell us. Um, or we blindly collect it. Well, we'll collect data on that. We'll collect data on that. We'll collect data on that. Um, and then look at the data and expect it to tell us something. Well, I don't have to be the first one to tell you that you can make data say almost anything that you want it to say. The way that you combat that as a barrier is to ask a question that you're looking for before the data is collected. If you're looking to find out just how many office referrals are happening amongst your first graders at the end of lunch, you're going to ask a question. How many office referrals are happening during this time and this time after first grade lunch, right? And then you're going to collect a certain type of data. You're going to collect office referrals between that one hour and, and you're gonna collect it. So that when you go to look at the, at the data, the data itself should answer that question or should inform that question, right? Um, because if you did it the other way around, like if you were just like, oh, wow, gee, there's, a, there's, some, there's an anomaly here in this big pile of data, what should we do about it? I mean, yeah, you know, you, you can do it that way, but I would argue that I don't think you'll get the same impact uh, as whether as if you had done it the opposite way. Know what it is that you're trying to answer so that you can collect the, the correct data, the, the data that will help you to get through that or get to the solution of that answer or that problem. And then I'm gonna take us way, 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 way back to week one when we talked about bias and we talked about um, like our own biases and how our biases sometimes can get in the way of the way that we uh, interact and work with children. Um, and that it's important that we recognize our biases um, because we want to be able to advocate for ourselves so that we can be in the most um, beneficial space, both physically, um, professionally and mentally so that we can provide for our students. So keep in mind that when you are collecting and looking at data, subjectivity and bias are the arch nemesis of that data. So um, there are going to be times where you are actually going to want to remove any identifiers of that data that might be connected to children. And the reason for that is because if you happen to know something about some child or some small group of children, it will be very difficult for you to look at that data pool and make decisions from that data pool without saying, yes, but that person does this all the time. Yes, but that child does that all the time. That yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. If you don't have that label or you don't have that particular um, identifier available to you, you won't know which data point is which student, right? And it also allows you to help bring in outside sources, another, another educator, another teacher, another program person, and then you can sit down and you can look at that data to use that data to the, to the good of the group and to the benefit of the program because it will, it's not a matter of confidentiality anymore, right? Because the data points aren't connected to certain children. So it allows you to gain better reliability um, of your data across the schools. Okay, hey, and the final component of resource mapping that we discussed originally was facilities. So here again is the space to identify somebody, to identify, create, and share. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure um, that you identify all of the space that you have available to work with students. So, and this can honestly be endless. Um, you can really think outside the box and be creative here. So a lot of schools have space um, in their title two classrooms, for example. Um, sometimes we can utilize space in a cafeteria, we can utilize outdoor space, which I highly recommend if needed. Um, there might be a, a guidance counselor office that if the guidance counselor is only there so often during the week, it's not all day every day. So perhaps when that person's not um, in, the, in the space physically, you can utilize her desk. Um, think spaces like that, think outside the box, school buses on the ride home or to school, etc. 
And then you can, again, create and share a, a sort of a space use schedule so that you can best utilize your facilities. So for example, you might put out to all um, educators that the cafeteria is available between 8 and 10.30 every day. Um, you can use that space to work with full groups, small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, um, whatever the support is that's needed, um, that space is, can be utilized for that during this time. Um, oops, sorry, Andrea, I went a little bit fast there. Let me go back just a second. Um, and then again, make sure that that's shared with the broader audience here, right? So it could be something that's posted in um, the classrooms or in a teacher's room. It might be something that goes out and is shared in a Google Drive or Google document that folks can utilize and, and see sort of in live time who's where. So if it's Tuesday and all of a sudden I need to utilize the cafeteria space, I can go on and see if anybody's in there. And if it's available, type my name in real quick so that it'll be live for others who perhaps check in. Um, so, so think outside the box, be creative. Facilities, um, facilities mapping even, having um, something drawn up and shared with folks to sort of see whose classrooms are where and what's available when um, can be a, bit, a huge resource for an MTSST. Um, okay, and so um, the big idea, again, to take with you about facilities is how you map out and utilize your facilities is equally or almost as important as how you budget your time, um, because you'll want to make sure that you are being creative about how you can make that space work as a resource for you and not as a constraint for you. Um, the example, I won't go into it in detail, but the example on the screen will will kind of take you through almost a a creative process where when a child enters a playground, they don't just look at that playground and say, well, that is a slide, that is a jungle gym, that is a merry-go-round. That slide might actually be an avalanche in an epic skiing adventure, or that jungle gym with the zip line tied to it, that might be your lifeline across a pit of hungry alligators, right? Children take a look at these items and they don't box them in. Children can view these facilities or don't often view these facilities as, um, as what we see them as. So utilizing space like the playground, for example, um, and viewing it as a resource that works for you and not against you um, can benefit your layering of supports um, with young students as needed. Um, and so additionally at the end there, time as a resource and space as a resource make a very good team. So when you when utilized effectively. So thinking about when the playground, um, going with this example, when the playground is available, when other classrooms aren't out there, um, and knowing that one student or a small group of students really benefit from being outside and using their imaginations on the playground, um, having that available can benefit you very effectively in this example here. So how you move students through time and space can make or break a time or budget. Okay, so the final piece here of this template um, is identifying somebody to sort of guide the capacity assessment work. Um, and this likely will take more than one meetings. Um, it, it's probably not just gonna be a quick agenda item on your, um, on your agenda for when you meet as a team. So just keep that in mind that moving forward, your capacity assessment work will likely be ongoing um, and wanting to make sure exactly who is available, what space, what data, what curriculum, et cetera, and, and the capacity to which you can um, implement those items. So the next thing that we have planned for everybody today is our small group action planning. So we wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity. Um, oops, sorry about that. Let's see if I get had an opportunity um, to get together with the folks that are from your districts with you today and sort of start these conversations. If you have already started these conversations, then certainly this can be a time um, to continue those conversations and look through the templates that Andrea shared, um, as well as the one that I've just shared in the chat box as well. Um, in addition to breaking out into those home small home groups today, we're going to ask that you incorporate a break into that time. So it's 4.15 now, break 